these states. I, I think I... Good evening to India. Good morning to our friends in uh, the US and uh, whatever time zone you're in Europe. Hello. Welcoming you to Tri Global Education SIG, which is special interest groups. This very amazing meeting with Professor Devashish Chatterjee of I Am Cozy Code. I have known Dr. Chatterjee um, since he was at I Am Lucknow. And I would like to say something interesting I learned yesterday talking to him. He went to the same school I went to in Delhi called JNU just about a few years after. That tells you that I'm dating myself <laughs> again. And uh, Dr. Devi Singh was the director of I Am Lucknow. He also had something in common with uh, Dr. Chatterjee. There's three people I know who went back to the institution twice to lead. And Dr. Devi Singh, Dr. Pritam Singh, good friend of mine, he's no more, uh, and um, Devashish. They have gone to the same institution twice. I used to find it's hard to be loved once, but he gets called in by unanimous votes of boards to come back to the institution he left. Devashish is uh, unique in many ways. He is a physician, if you don't know, who went to study English literature in JNU and then went to study management and he became the artist of management. I, I look at this way, we all go to do MA in subject. He became master of the subject every time he touched something. And um, from Lucknow, he, uh, he came to uh, Harvard as well. And that's when we met last. It's been quite a while, actually. So I was very happy when um, uh, Sri um, Ram, in fact, suggested Professor Chatterjee's name. I said, that would be an amazing experience because when I went to Lucknow, I am, um, when Devi Singh was the director, he told me, I want you to meet one person. And he gave me one person, Devashish Chatterjee's name. And the only person I remember from I am Lucknow, I said, Dr. Devi Singh is Devashish. So Devashish, glad to have you here. And um, now my, my role is to introduce Tai. Tai is, a, is an institution I've been part of almost 25 years, not exactly because some people joined before I did. And I've seen it grow as a community which keeps us together. It's not about what you get from it, what you give to it. And it keeps growing. And today we have a, a 60 plus chapters, 14 countries, 3000 charter members. And charter members are generally very successful people in business, in executive roles, in understanding how business moves the world. And some people who are thinking, professors and uh, leaders in their own space, they get invited to be charter members at, at various chapters that we have. But it's a community that actually uh, helps us remain stable in, in times like these and, and think ahead and, and allows us to continuously think in terms of creating a new world. Satya is an example of one of those who in fact uh, should be a poster boys of what uh, Tai aspires to engage with. Satya, I look at him as a multifaceted, talented person who is not just an entrepreneur, he is an amazing executive, he is more than that, what I like more about him since I began my roots as an editor of newspaper, he is a poet, he is an Urdu poet, and not just Urdu, he looks at from Sanskrit to Urdu, that's extraordinary. So I think we have a bunch of very extraordinary people here, uh, Professor Chatterjee, he's a sui generis in my opinion, and Satya, you too. So Satya is the one who is going to lead this uh, very, very exciting conversation I'm looking forward to, and let me hand it over to Satya now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Satish. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, Devashish. Uh, pleasure connecting with you and uh, facilitating this interaction uh, on this uh, uh, stage of uh, Thai Global. Uh, Devashish, the, the theme that has been given to us is about uh, higher education and the future of it. And uh, one thing that makes this conversation very fascinating for me is that you have connected higher education with leadership almost in the same breath at all times that I have known you or, or we have interacted with. And the, and, the, and the third dimension is, and that's where I would want to start before coming back and covering the macro part of higher education. I want to start with, with one very interesting and a favorite area of yours, which is the leadership lessons from the Gita. Okay, and if you're ready, I would, I would, I would uh, uh, 
pause for a moment for you to be able to say hi to everyone and then and then fire the first question to you devash okay. hi hi everybody and it's a tough question coming i know but nevertheless <laughs> good to see you guys yeah so debashish uh, you know uh, you have been you have been uh, bringing leadership and geeta into your management teaching and research for as long as i have known you so i would want to start by asking you a question uh, you know geeta is called the moksha shastra a manual for liberation okay that's that that's that's a great broadest definition that i can think of whereas the management education it sounds a little bit more mundane and almost we have reduced it or we look at it from the from the prism of making money or wealth how would you how would you kind of uh, uh, how do you connect these two in the same breath well um, interesting question so you have to decode both the gita and the art of making money from the fundamental principles i don't think making money would be the aspiration of anybody sitting here on behalf of tai it's the romance of wealth creation not making or being counting that's what entrepreneurship is all about but if you look at gita or any other text that has the kind of uh, depth and scrutiny of thousands of years of people not just reading it living it you know before i wrote this book called timeless leadership i met 200 uh, uh, people ceos monks people who have never read the gita complete agnostics and i had a reason to believe that moksha shastra doesn't mean that it liberates you from the prison of this body alone it also means that it liberates you from tags titles labels that people suffer in corporations people right. suffer in you see we are we have self created prisons of our own making right. where we are both the prisoner as well as the prison guards and so how do you solve a problem of somebody who willingly imprisons himself or herself and gita tells you a way out and you know the two aspects of the gita that i want to talk about see i had spent quite some time in minnesota in a, in a place called center for christian social thought learning about christianity i i learned about the quran from a friend of mine from egypt and i looked at the gita from the perspective of practitioners see yes, that's that's what made the perspective and the writing so unique so there's a classic uh, you no know, statement that most people reading the gita often quote uh, and it is chapter 2 verse 47 if i remember correctly it says karma karma ne vadika raste ma phale su kadachana and loosely it is translated by generations of our elders as uh, you have the right to the work but don't hanker for the fruits of your work okay right. now don't desire fruits of your work and i told myself is there any work that i can do without desiring the fruit it's stupid thinking to imagine that i would desire not desire the results of what i'm doing and and so i lend myself to scrutinizing this very very important verse so i realized that desiring is a human privilege you know a dog cannot desire or a buffalo cannot desire as much as i can so if it's endowed to me as a gift i must mm-hmm. recognize that desiring is a very powerful mechanism through which we achieve anything in the world and to cut desire at its root is to essentially extinguish life at its roots so what is the sutra telling me it is telling me that you know desiring is a perfectly legitimate aspiration you should do your work also desire the fruits of your work however and this mm-hmm. is the caveat of the gita Then, right. however when the fruits come you have you have to realize there is a non linear connection between your effort and the results because effort is on your part the results are contextual right so i go sure. to catch a bus a classic example from one of my teachers great teacher the gita is i go to catch a bus and the uh-huh. bus comes on time and i catch the catch the bus on time so my desire and the results meet and then right. second second scenario i go to catch a bus and the bus just goes past my nose so between my desire and the result the results are less than what i desired and then i go to catch a bus the bus goes past me but a friend of mine gives me a sort of ride on his new car and i reach the office earlier than scheduled so my results <laughs> more than my desire and the fourth option is i i go to catch a bus and i'm run over by another one and a totally unexpected <laughs> there's no correlation between desire and results now the the gita is saying that all these four scenarios will pan pan out in terms of relations between effort and results if you are mentally equipped to deal with yeah. all yeah. four scenarios you are called as yeah. thita pragya 
Yeah. You know, Siddha Prigya is the evolved, evolved state of a businessman, an entrepreneur, a monk, a monkey, yeah. whatever you call yeah. it, a manager, yeah. who is able to deal with reality much right. more effectively and efficiently. So Gita's, and then there's this chapter 254th, uh, uh, chapter 254th verse, Arjun is saying that, you know, so who is this Sita Prakya? How does he look like? How does he walk? And Krishna's response to this is very simple. He says, you know, Sita Prakya is not something otherworldly. It's, it's, it's you. It's now, I've come to recognize after having read the Gita, and I'll finish it in the next two minutes, that every human being has four faculties. Uh, your reason, rationality, your emotional resilience, emotional response to reality, your willpower, and your ingenuity. These are the four dimensions of the human personality. And the mm -hmm. Gita says, if any of these four are out of sync mm -hmm. with each other, you're going to have trouble. And so mm -hmm. the fundamental solution of the Gita is not go and find solutions out there. The anchors for your solution, the, the more volatile the world gets, the more mm -hmm. vicious it gets, the more unpredictable it gets, the deeper has to be your anchor. And those anchors that connect all these four elements of the human personality, your reason, your emotion, your will, and your ingenuity, in the, in the fundamental depth of who you are, which is Siddha Pragya, is I think the fundamental lesson of the Gita. So if you're established in the, in the, um, invincibility of, of being a Siddha Bhagya, then you can take any results that come your way and move on without getting, uh, without getting, you know, boxed in by the world. That's what my take on the Gita is. I hope it's a good way to warm up. I hope. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Devashish. Uh, great start at the deep end of the pool. Uh, <laughs> okay. That's a nice uh, one. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> So, uh, Devashish, I th you know, you, uh, now I'm wanting to kind of just jump a little bit to cover the, you know, the application of these broad thought leading uh, perspectives that you always had to, right. to, to, the, to, the, to the macro of education. And I would right. want to, I would, want, I would love all of us to hear your thoughts on. So, hmm. how do you see the future of both management education? and higher education evolving to be able to integrate a whole lot of these uh, new synthesis of thoughts. You know, it's just, it's just not either Eastern or Western, only technology mm -hmm. or only art. But just kind of suspend all that I'm saying, and I would just want to hear your clean thoughts on how do you see management education and higher education evolving over the next decade or two? Broad brushes. You see, fundamentally, any form of education, higher, lower, mid, um, intermediary, the core of education is to liberate the learner. If you look at what education means to a middle-class Indian talent growing out and making a mark in the world, it liberates potential of that human being. Knowledge is the key, uh, and, and education is the means to get that key. Mm. So if you look mm. at the changes that are already happening, if you look at higher mm. education, let's take the context of higher education. There are four mm. functions of higher education universities, IIMs. One is creation of knowledge, two mm. is uh, dissemination of that knowledge, three is accreditation, and four is monetization. Now, mm. at each of these intersections, there's a value proposition. Now, you have to right. decide what kind of institution you want to be. You have to look at that extraordinary synthesis of the four. There's nothing right. else beyond, beyond the four. But the creation okay. part is the most difficult part. So mm. if you look at leadership of higher education, it means that can I see the culture of creating knowledge? And okay. you see today, uh, knowledge of tomorrow in the next 10, next 10 years will come from uh, the intersection of silos, you know, biotechnology, sports medicine, conscious capitalism, and you name it. Uh, if you look at the culture of creating this knowledge across the, you know, we, people are, our education policy says we want multi-disciplinary uh, orientation to education. I, I have a better word for it. I would call it transdisciplinary, which means a, a guy getting a Nobel Prize in physics should also be capable of getting a Nobel Prize in chemistry because this is actually liberating knowledge from silos to knowledge that is yeah. existential that helps us evolve. And so okay. if you look at the nature of education by 2030, if you, if you get, if you get the data more or less right, you realize that there'll be about 
billion middle class people in the world. Mm -hmm. They will not have enough money to pay for the kind of education Harvard, MIT, even IIM, that is provide. But they will have an aspiration, which will be phenomenal. Now, mm -hmm. if you think of university as one building where knowledge is disseminated across the counter, that thought itself is defeating the very nature of the aspiration out there. So I see right. university systems as a hub, not rather than a series of structures where knowledge will seamlessly flow across the system. And so it doesn't mm. matter where you want to enroll for studies. You mm. should be able to do that at a price performance point that you can afford. And mm. I, think, I, can, I think the exclusivities will remain. You know, our Harvards will have to collaborate with Net, Netflixes to, <laughs> to get out there. And so those, sure. those, those relationships will, unlikely relationships will happen, but the exclusivities will remain. However, there's, a, there's this movement that we see. See, people used to come to IIM, 200,000 people take, taking the test. We're taking only 2,200 odd people. One is 200 making it to the IIM. Now, IIMs are going to students. You are aware that we are yeah, now digitally. Yeah. We, are, yeah. we have roughly 1,000 students on campus and about 10,000 more outside the campus, each IIM. Mm -hmm. So there are 20, mm -hmm. 20 IIMs. So you can see that when technology is taking knowledge from hardware to software to everywhere, and so the very nature of what education learning is will change from, from learning as a function of time to learning as a function of attention. Learning as a function of place to learning as a function of space. And what is a space? Anywhere that you can structure the flow of curiosity will be a learning mm -hmm. space. So mm -hmm. I can start a school under a banyan tree with a uh, Zoom connection. And I right. can easily get about three, four hundred of my former students to listen to me with rapt attention on the subject of Vedanta, because there mm -hmm. are enough of those out there, <laughs> crazy right. guys. So why right. would I want to unnecessarily spend my time going to? So technology will do the enabling work, but please, please remember this: that there's a caveat here. The kind of educational uh, practices that are pushed by the techno-commercial forces are not necessarily educationally sound. Sure. Because, you know, education flourishes in a culture. So the, if the right. university doesn't have a culture, students create their own culture. In JNU, we had subcultures. You know, Satish will remember in JNU, there was a catchphrase called last hogia. Last hogia means the ultimate <laughs> of anything yeah. has happened. Now, this <laughs> was the, this was the student version of what professors would not be able to articulate. Yeah. Now, if you don't have students creating those cultures in physical space or even inside, but those culture creation is I mm. think the fundamental uh, principle of leadership in education. You see, I see sure. the culture and I get out of the way. Because if I am not able to do that, I'm only doing sure. a postman's job of you know, monetizing and accrediting knowledge. The creation of knowledge happens from those hubs. And I think, you know, I am Cody Code has a vision called 2047. And right. that yeah. we're asking that question. Independent yeah. India will be, independent India will be 100 years old and I am Cody Code will be 50 years old on that year. Wow. And we're asking what should we stop doing from now so that we still remain relevant in 2047. Yeah. And the first few things that come to my head is that we must break through this whole notion of IIM or university as a sacrosanct structure where impermeable to scrutiny of other education spaces and, and dishing out time, taste, and knowledge of 20 years through case studies. You know, Harvard has case study, MIT has labs. What has IIMs got? So I yeah. had a room I had a room called Silence. I said, you see, I am in silence. And so we, we absorb the best in the world and we reflect to the world with that which is the best. So we have a reflective capacity which is unique to India. And I think we must build on that capacity. And I think if MIT has a poverty lab, we should have an affluence lab in India. Yeah. Yeah. Why should we worry about poverty? <laughs> and so, so we have a counterpoint in this country and this country has the wherewithals. We have some very creative solutions to our education challenges for the whole world, not just for India. And I, I think we are up to it. We are alive to that possibility. Okay. One, one, one a bit of a, a question that is relevant acutely in the current context and, and that yeah. is quite uh, manifesting itself in this, in this uh, webinar, uh, Devashish, which is right. uh, mm -hmm. what, what are the very noticeable disruptions that mm -hmm. you are seeing on account mm -hmm. of COVID, on account of COVID? Because you just spoke about, you know, disrupting this notion of a structure, uh, you know, physical one, etc. And, and COVID kind of has pushed us a little in that direction. But I would right. want you to uh, share one or two thoughts on impact of COVID on higher education that you see is that is likely to last beyond COVID itself. 
Yeah. See, the thing is that the uh, agility of a virus has exposed the fragility of a knowledge ecosystem. You can see very right. clearly yeah. that we are not we are not able to uh, not able to decode. Yeah. What does a virus do to us? I mean, so and so what it does require is a this is a, this is a complexity of an enormous proportion. And you see, the the only way to deal with complexity is not simplicity, not simplistic thinking. The only uh, antidote to complexity is coherence, coherence mm -hmm. of multiple disciplines. And this was mm -hmm. in the air, but mm -hmm. you know what this virus has done is it has brought multiple stakeholders to try and solve a problem. So you can okay. see, uh, COVID is drawing the health community, the economists, the artists, design mm -hmm. designers, and. This is a massive journey in our society. And I can see that the future of education will be impacted hugely by it. You know, I had a course in IIM that I forced uh, 27 of my faculty to teach. The course was called Money. And 27 faculty had to come together with their perspectives on money. They fought okay. with each other. The school uh -huh. course was a dismal failure, but we learned from that phenomenally. Uh -huh. We learned that when many disciplines come and, and jostle around, a very powerful right. thing called money, there is bound to be uh, no territorial wars. And those right. wars are necessarily, the, are necessary churning points. Until right. you begin to realize that, you know, in truth, in reality, knowledge is one. You know, this mm -hmm. is what Vedanta has told us. The word, the reality is one, but Rishi is seen in multiple ways. So the, the, the search for reality uh, beyond the anthro, anthropocentric world, the human world of making and getting money. I think the economist's version of the world or the engineer's version of the world will be suitably tempered by right. a very different. So we will see competence and compassion rising. I had a conversation with the Dalai Lama last week, and this was my third, third in a series of conversations. So I asked him, so what is your take on what the future of education would be? He said something interesting. He said, look, the ancient uh, values of India, principles of India are going mm -hmm. to be very critical for the whole world. He said, mm. uh, global, global warming is not a phenomenon of north, south, east, west. <laughs> or a global warming is a global phenomenon. And for right. us to understand global warming, we need values that create it. So it's a values crisis. It's not an environmental crisis. And the solution mm. will come from understanding the why these values are important, why mm. they need brought back to the education space, not downloaded from a from percepts point of view, but essentially offloaded into our cognitive map because without those values everything else crumbles and you can see what's happening uh, around covid the scramble right. for power territorial right. you're trying to win an election at the cost of lives of people now these are essential nature of what happens when people lose their bearings as to what it means to live in a you know co-equal world with other right. species and that that i think is going to be the most critical addition of education of the future and I fundamentally believe that uh, algorithm has to handhold all altruism, without which there is no hope for algorithms. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Algorithms yeah. Will, will create an universe of structure of of something that you can manipulate, but right. altruism, altruism is what will trigger the, mm -hmm. the ch churning within the human communities that we need to use those structures meaningfully. Otherwise, those structures will destroy us. As we can as we can see, it's happening. It's right there. Sure. Lovely, 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 lovely. Brilliant getting, sleeper. No, no. I don't know what, no, no, time, just, what time guys are feeling, but you know, if it's too heavy, you can lighten the process a little bit. Yeah, the good thing is nobody will be impolite to beat beat you up or beat me up for the next 20, <laughs> 30 minutes. So we'll, we'll take advantage of that. Well, I'm, 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 you know the the, the rich the richness of having grown through this higher education uh, system for you is enormous and i would want to acknowledge that you know you spent almost 30 years and 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 uh, uh, forgive me if i if you think if i'm putting you in a spot but i'm i'm going to ask you a very uh, very important question in all earnestness okay which sure. is you know if magically you were to become the minister for hrd Okay, or 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 the or the mentor for higher education in India. Okay, and and I would want you to answer this in all earnestness, uh, Devashish. If this is not a rhetorical question or or or, or a joke, you know, sure. with with all these potential to be unlocked ahead of us 
as 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 something that is waiting for somebody to happen and with the challenges that you would have seen hands on I, and and frustration at times could have, could be a very mild word that that to the extent that i am aware of but how do you uh, how do you bring all of this to deploy your wisdom and do two interventions i want you to be very specific to the extent possible what two interventions you would do to unleash the potential of indian higher education see the, the first and foremost intervention i will have is restore the leadership of the educational institutions to educationists okay. you know i can okay. be a politician and make a politically sound decision which is educationally completely disastrous <laughs> <laughs> because i would what politicians do they maximize votes and you have to give them that right to do so what right. an economist does maximize profit or you know a businessman maximizes profit what a student does is maximize votes what a right. teacher does maximize learning so if you want to maximize or you want to optimize or you want to add value to learning you have to bring an education guy our first uh, president second president radha krishnan was uh, was born on september 5 teachers day i was listening to his speech 50 years back the extraordinary clarity the man has and and he understands that you should see education is something that you that you don't get necessarily in a school or a college or university it is the way you evolve as a, as a human being and right. i personally feel that if one intervention which is to bring an educationist at the helm of affairs right you know it, this is to be the principle that somebody has then the decisions this person will take will be consistent with the with the rationale of the existence of, of, of an institution of an institution of our education that will be one intervention the second thing that if i if i look at it is to i will try and think of creativity as a way of life in the school system you know there is a lot of things around what you call art integration right in science, science classes and all of that which is a I, th- i think a very cosmetic way of looking at what is missing in the education space in india which mm-hmm. is there is no premium for creativity right so how do i design those you know in, in our design principles we should have elements of creativity built in so if right. a teacher is going to uh, speak for 30 minutes in a 45 minutes class i would ask the teacher to speak for no less than no more than let's say one third of that 10 minutes you know i still remember this is harvard a uh, guy who was teaching a biology class of 1000 students he said two and a half minutes lecture for and this has to be and 1000 students so in a group of two the students will have to sort of re- relay to each other what they heard in that lecture and then in a minute they have to summarize what they learned from each other and fundamentally it was en- enabling the entire class to create that knowledge co create that knowledge in a in a and and so who said you can't hold a class with 1000 students that was yeah. my you no know, revelation so i said uh-huh. is, it, is it possible to look at creativity is not about writing poetry you know for right. most people think creativity is a, in a pecking order is fine arts and all that nonsense that right. thinking go creativity in a, i hear business people are calling uh, you know hollywood and bollywood as creative industries i said what do you mean i mean every industry is creative <laughs> you can't think of all the creative industry and and creating muffins is not non creative and there is creativity the pro- only problem is when the education system does not give value mm-hmm. to a creative effort of a student or a child right at right. the outset his creativity skills nullified so the the fundamental shift that should happen from a colonial education that made us rote learners and we were sort of you know jnu was the first place i discovered that there was a creative way of being and living and thinking and so this is a my, i didn't have to go to harvard or mit which i later did but jnu was my mind blowing in terms of how a professor could start a class so the class starts with discussing a no- novel i had i had not yet written and i was planning to write so what was i was i planning to write it took me 30 years to actually finish that novel and i did that yeah, uh, this this afternoon <laughs> so the last night i said well well prasad you will now uh, now acknowledge that i have made a commitment and, and so the, the, the fundamental and so when i started teaching i am lucknow uh, i i spent some time with peter sang in mit and i learned you know the way he took, used to teach systems thinking i looked at ronnie hyfeld's class in harvard kennedy school the way he would teach adaptive leadership so i said uh, let me start my courses in i am lucknow with instrumental music that students themselves will compose and and play and so you know that it set the parameters of what we could do in that class in of, of 90 minutes or 60 minutes 
very different from downloading information or data or concepts. Right. And, and, right. and my was the most the name DevChat was acquired because of the. <laughs> The I chat. was chatting. It was just a chat. <laughs> it was not a class. <laughs> it was a chat. Was chatting. And, and, and I thought it was a huge impact. And many students of that class were now in Silicon Valley. Will tell you that yeah, they, right. they remember those classes far more than the most things in, that they learned. Yeah, no so, doubt, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. So, that actually sets, sets the stage for me to move to the next theme that I'm holding in my head, uh, Dev Chat, which is. Now that you are at the at the helm of uh, uh, you know this translating the 20, 20, 2047 vision of I am Code, uh, yeah. uh, how do you, how do you see the institution emerging? Uh, let's say over the next decade, what what one or two areas that you are looking at to make a mark as an outstanding institution of management and leadership? So we, we are looking at an institution as an evolving space for the future of global reckoning. We are not, see, we have just entered the QS ranking. Six IIMs have got into the first 100, 100 odd. Right. Uh, Amdavad, Bangalore, Calcutta, because chronologically they have been much before us. <laughs> they are within the first 100, but we are not far behind. So six right. IIMs now yeah. among the universities, mind you. And it's yeah. a matter of time when... Indian institutions, you know, look at fourth century, seventh century, Hyun Sung uh, writing about Indian uh, university in Alanda. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and he was saying, and his memoir is called Journey to the West. You know, India was literally the West and not just right. geographical West, but I, in terms of ideas. In terms of, so if we, and if they were ranking of universities, universities would have been the top 10 in the world, Indian universities, Texas, Shila, right. Nalanda. Where did we lose out? We lost out because we were not evolving those universities in uh, we were not get being relevant to the times yep. so nalanda was essentially buddhism unfolding you know the right. principles of buddhism. but i'm saying that our universities will have to look at unfolding what might happen in the future we have to be three steps behind ahead ahead of our curve and yeah. we looked at you know i am kori code for instance looked at um, digitizing 2001 we went digital because not because of any great creative streak but simply because it was a compulsion for us to go right. digital cut off to go to delhi i had some sometimes had to go via dubai because of the connectivity issues right? so you can imagine the constraints pushed us towards going digital but that was not the only thing going digital was not the idea the idea was to look at space as never a constraint mm -hmm. in in in, in educational process. And mm -hmm. we started this year and we start, we looked at gender diversity as the first, you know, for the first time in the history of IMS, we had 54% women. Wow. You are aware that the national media yeah. picked up the story and it was, and so for, uh, we restored and we, uh, it was asked of me, why did I have to bring, uh, was it not diluting the meritocracy? I said, no way, mm -hmm. because if 50% of the MBAs of a country are not women, then you imagine the aspiration that we're living behind. How can a 50% right. are cut off from coming to the mainstream of decision making on the boards, then yeah. this country cannot be as a whole say, said to be tapping into its talent pool because diversity is very was very critical. So we ever we took on the mantle of diversity leadership, starting with gender diversity. Now you okay. can see diversity playing out in pedagogy. Our board, IMK board has 40% women board members. Uh -huh. You see, our pres president of our student association is now based in Chicago. She's a woman you know, who's uh -huh. going to Berkeley to study. And you can see the the idea was not about, the idea was about dispersing the locus of learning across a whole segment that was not touched hitherto by the higher education space, particularly MBA. So that was it. The, the, the other thing that I'm looking at in terms of vision for the future is liberal education will become critical to mm. not a subsidiary to management or engineering, but critical complement. Because yeah. only, only through liberal education can you look at open-ended problems of the world. Right. Things that don't don't fetch an engineering solution or a cause effect solution and right. i think i think the first mba that we are offering for the first time in the history of an i am we have an mba in liberal studies and management and you know our teachers for this course starting with the dalai lama would be very different from the so we will have they will have their core management subjects but they will have inputs from music from the literature i'm teaching a course there called readings in literature where mm -hmm. we have how this is siddhartha we have um, uh, we have, you know, uh, sure. 
Peter Drucker's work, we have several eclectic mix of ideas and they can pick and choose which is that idea they connect with the most. So I think our future in the IIM system will be largely the IIM university, not IIM as a standalone school. IIMs are IITs and IITs will connect to so 20 IIMs and about 24, 25 IITs if they come together as one unit. This is a formidable, formidable force. And yeah. then, and we would we would have to operate as a brand, and I think there's no greater brand if this collective is taken together in the whole world. If you just bring this in units together, mind you, Yale University started with an Indian donation from Chennai. Carpet maker paid some money, and Yale got its first boost lease of life. So the culture of giving to institutions will have to be brought back again. Corporates will have to come and say, "Hey, I made a little money, and our best hope is." invest in India. If Ratan Tata mm -hmm. can go and, and, and build a hall in Harvard, well, mm -hmm. uh, he should know where his money is going. He's a mm -hmm. wise man. But yeah. part of that will come to the IM system, IM brand, and I'm sure corporates will now turn to education. Uh, yeah. And you see, the beauty of Nalanda was the king gave money and get out, got out of it. The yeah. king never said, you must employ my own men as teachers. The king you know, <laughs> separated his money-giving prowess with non-intervention. And so if yeah. our corporates gave and said, okay, uh, educationists should run this kind of school, I'm pretty certain Indian schools have world-class leaders and they will have world-class corporate houses funding some of the ventures of the school. And it's a matter of time, just a matter of time. When IITs, IIMs are in the global league, ahead of many of the big names that you're hearing about yeah. today. So in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the context, uh, just going a step further, uh, uh, Devashish, you know, yeah. every, every business entrepreneur, CEO, he's, he's seeing himself, his business, and he's a super successful hands-on 24 by seven CEO. He's seeing yeah. his own businesses, business models, etc., disrupted by these young, absolutely mad, youngsters from very modest backgrounds and, and all that stuff that we are seeing all the time as business guys. Okay. Yes. My question, my question to you is, are you seeing business schools, especially, uh, but, but you're, you're, um, uh, you're welcome to talk on behalf of the higher education in India, especially, are you seeing business schools and technology schools bracing up for these changes in their curriculum to accommodate yeah. for this kind of a preparedness for the real world? Uh, mm -hmm. if, Love to hear from you. Yeah, we have to understand, unlike the industry, business, I see, business as usual doesn't work anymore, but business schools as usual also doesn't work anymore. But the rate of change in industry will be different from rate of change in business schools. <laughs> we are not guided by the sensex. I'm not reporting quarterly for my profit. So you have to understand the two trajectories of change. Right. Of course, our, our courses are going to change. Of course, our pedagogy is going to shift. Uh, but we would do things in a way that is in tandem with how educationists think about change. Right. Because they, this is a conservative bunch of people. They're not willing right. to change quickly as industry models would change. However, right. these changes will be, will be forced upon some and some will create those changes. You know, great, a great school is not always driven by the market. They drive the market as well. Yeah, so what is to what, what, if Rahul Bajaj or or Ratan Tata tells me to do something in a particular way because the industry is doing it, I will ask him a counter question. I mean, why should you do it this way? Why not the way I think it should be done? So yeah, I, I sure. think the academic sure. institution should be able to give that leadership to the. This is what the rishis did for the rajas, right? Right. What is right. The rishi? rishi is the reflective capacity. Raja is the dynamism. So a rajashi yeah. was the model, was a leadership model. So Raja was the executive who knew how to get yeah. things done. Uh, Rishi yeah. had the ability to reflect and give direction. And so without a Krishna, there is no, no Arjun. Without a Chanakya, there is no Chandragupta. Without an Aristotle, there is no Alexander. So you have yeah. to understand that, that the fundamental shift that has to happen. Yeah. yeah. The two Actually, ways, I, yeah. yeah. So, so the, the two ways that these two function. And if you see what has not happened so far, is that the mm. reflective capacity and the active capacity have, have never come together in mm. ways that we are forced to right now. And I can mm. tell you, without that reflection, corporates have no, no sense of the world. And without any action, academic institutions are dead, dead meat. And so both are complementary. And this is where I see uh, things happening. And the youngsters are far, they have a leg, leg ahead of us. You know, they sure. are fast, 
faster to adapt and all of that. But they yeah. sometimes may not have the direction. So I think the hindsight wisdom would help, uh, provided mm. we know how to bring about this synthesis. And it is not happening in the industry. Mm. See, an industry, industry guy, his attention is distracted by the quarter. He can't listen to a deep conversation such as the one we started with. Huh. Unless you unless you convert that conversation into action points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, 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 I know, and, and, it should be yeah. my part to, uh, to uh, decode yeah. the Gita with all this. Work. So I have to simplify the Gita to a point where the guy able, is able to relate to it. And I think it is, it is okay for us to say that we have to go to the market with, the, with our ideas in a way that the market is able to understand. But at the same time, we have, don't have to be co-opted by the market to think in a certain way always. Because, you know, that freedom, autonomy of an, of an education space is the greatest gift you can give to a human being. Yeah. To think freely. And, you know, in JNU, we had two, two very prominent political parties. One was called the SFIs and yeah. the others were called free thinkers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and there used to be a presidential debate, if Satish should remember. And the SFIs would not make it to the civil services, the free thinkers would. And so SFIs would always complain. And, and free thinkers would say, see, both of us compete. You also want those jobs, but we make it, you don't. So there is a, there is a premium on free thinking. And I think that's the biggest challenge in an algorithmic world that you are not thinking. You are digitally you know, uh, this, uh, you are digitally marked away in a, some, some way. There's this identity politics that is marking you as a certain entity. And I think to get out of that requires serious investments in education and reflection. And that's the only way out, I think. So, yeah, go okay. Ahead. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the, the, you, you, you made this beautiful point about uh, Chanakya, Chandragupta. I'm, I'm just kind of uh, picking, picking that up for a minute more before I go to the last part of our conversation. Uh, yeah. So, you know, uh, or, or, or the Vashishta to, to, it, to whom uh, Dilipaha went, or, or, or the uh, uh, Chanakya, Chandragupta, uh, or, or Arjuna and Krishna. Yeah. Or in, in the modern times, a couple of examples that we have interacted with, uh, you know, like Dr. C.K. Prahlad. You know, it was, he, was, he, was, he was a very practicing uh, Rishi. You know, he, he had great respect uh, that he earned from the corporate CEOs. And he was actively involved in coaching and mentoring the youth in the modern uh, Western uh, best of institutions. And, 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 and the Raja found the time and effort to go and meet, meet his guru at his humble campus. Okay. So yeah. now my, my, my question is, in India, do, can I, I'm speaking for myself, can I think of two, three, four, five such people? Or yes. what is it that we must do to get those guys to come and sit on the most beautiful campus in the world, like where you are sitting, Devashish, and, and 500 CEO or a young, young entrepreneur who's, who's your alum, who's raised $100 million from a, a stinking rich, richest private equity guy in the world. He comes and says, sir, Charan Kamal hai? strategy discuss karna hai. Can I find can I can I get one hour of your time? Yeah. So my yeah. question again to you is, are you seeing that happening uh, gently or you, you think it's happening in, in, enough and I'm not uh, seeing it enough? I would like to see it. Is there, is there a CK Pralad in a dozen campuses? Just yeah. to give an example. It's a, it's a great question. Let me give you a specific example rather than beat, beat around the bush. You know, I, 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 uh, I was invited by the chief minister of the state of Kerala to uh, you know, see if I could help him in some way or the other. So he mm -hmm. gave me three uh, agenda items. He said health, uh, infrastructure and waste management are two or three of my major challenges as the chief minister. Can you help me? Uh, can I get into a conversation with you? So I, I started a conversation. Then I said, you know, why didn't you come and spend a whole day with me at your entire cabinet? I'm going to spend time uh, talking to you bilingually, Hindi and English, and we'll translate this in Malayalam. And so you will get a conversation opportunity, but there are, there's a, there are rules. I would say, you said, right. what are the rules? And the rules are that you have to pay a fee, and this will be a government deal. It cannot be given to a businessman to outsource. You will not be allowed your secretaries and your police uh, escorts, and your phones have to be switched off. And so we'll have a one-day full conversation. He said, can you Super. tell us? 
no he said can you tell yeah. us how to win the next election i said no, <laughs> no i said no i can't tell you how to win the next election however i can tell you how you will not win it and so yeah. he was sort of shocked and that got him to our campus along with the entire cabinet and i said while i was talking to him, i said today election is about a generation and a generation is 5 years not 10 years and right. if you have not won a, if you cannot win the next generation you cannot win the next election it is very clear that the issues yeah. of the next generation and we did we did deep research i had 40 researchers looking at uh-huh. the health record looking at the health record of the entire cabinet looking at decoding their speeches we did okay. hard research work and we presented hard non refutable data right in front of them about okay. what kerala was what the actuality what was the perception of course the chief minister lost the election and he is going to be reelected again this time around but i can tell you that our credibility was built on a very foundational value which is missing in politics and business of course with great with great exceptions there which is truth sure. you know sure. we do not academics should not sacrifice truth to the altar of convenience and business yeah. is largely about convenience so is politics but academics yeah. is the only place where you can tell the truth and get away with it because you will not yeah. be if you were tenured nobody can throw you out from your job i think if that goes away from academic life that's the job of the rishi if the rishi cannot speak truth to power then he he, he becomes subservient to power and this is what i have okay. seen you know our prime minister spoke in globalizing indian thought and before he spoke i sent a note to the pm i'm telling you honestly what i did mm-hmm. initially mm-hmm. he said pm does not have time because no, small no, 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 no. okay and so yeah so the question yeah. we he said i wrote a letter to him i said if the prime minister of india does not have time for a small town in india then i have doubts about his commitment to the country and it was a caustic letter a very courageous letter to written by a small fry but you know instantly i got immediately as the email reached he said he's agreed to come and he'll speak give us some bullet points i said he cannot make a political speech here because this is kerala and i'm in charge of an institution so it has to be a academic speech on globalizing indian thought so his uh, it uh, person is the person who helps him with the it he said you leave that to the prime minister's wisdom you cannot tell him what he should speak i said no i cannot tell him but i can su- suggest to him what he should not because this is a very different space and yeah. <laughs> and yeah. trust me and trust me his speech of 20 minutes is recorded you can see it had no political connotation he spoke to the t as to what was supposed to be relevant to an academic institution like ours really? now you can talk you can talk like that provided sure. you have no agenda behind sure. beyond sure. your you, sure. you know and course, sometimes it does not work it may not work it may not yeah. work but yeah. uh, but but i believe that's the only thing that works in the world where truth is at, at a premium and, and, yeah. and you have to live for it otherwise there's no point being in an academic life sure that's sure it. sure sure yeah sure. go ahead so uh, one, one last question this is about you and then I, and then we'll have time to pick up one or two questions that are waiting our attention they they wish uh, yeah. this is uh, you know as a as a as a as a person as an educationist uh, there would be some legacy that you would want to leave when you begin to kind of uh, slow down uh, in, the, in in an official word these days are is not not an era of retirement but as an head of institution that's likely to happen at some point in time so what is that a legacy in, uh, motivation that that drives you and that you would want to leave behind uh, truthfully legacy is not about the future i do not think of the future as much as people assume i do of course i have a sense of the future you know i think legacy is created here and now you know a, a classic example is like a, a jet plane leaving a white trail in its back at its at its wake it's right. the trail happens because of the engine throbbing right so legacy right. is is to have a passionate and compassionate heart at work while you are going to work every day right yeah and you see first thing i did during my second term as director i removed my own name plate from under the word director because i mm-hmm. thought it is <laughs> the name is going to be a problem because you know people when they say farewell at the end of 5 years they say 
will miss you. There was no one like you. And then in the same breath, when the new person comes in, they will say, well, the guy was a megalomaniac, egocentric. He thought he was doing it, they were doing it all. <laughs> and then I'll spare you that agony of having to <laughs> say a farewell speech, which doesn't mean anything. The idea yeah. of our legacy is, I think, too romanticized. I, I think every day you have to go to work and ask the question, do I deserve to be on this chair? And if I deserve to be on this chair, what must I do differently? Than, than, than a guy who would automatically come to the... And so every day, if I try to qualify for the job that I already have, a little more competent, a little more compassionate than I, I was here the pre previous day, I think then you set a benchmark for yeah. if necessary for others to emulate and also also you know, overwhelm and, and create their own benchmarks going forward. I think my privilege was to see IIMs in the global space. Mm -hmm. to, accredited with what we call the triple crown, which most schools in the world have, top, top 100 schools. We are right. there, almost there. To see I am Cori Code in a small town in India, yeah. to be an a institution of Indian impact and global reckoning, we have gone there. But I think we have miles to go because if 2047 is the benchmark, then you imagine the enormity of the work at hand. Mm -hmm. And I've played a very small role, and my legacy is only the hard work that that I hope is worthy of emulation. And if it is not, then of course, I can't uh, say uh, that. Uh, uh, a, 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 little, a little tongue in cheek, but one task that you have, and you, I don't think you can ever achieve that, Devashish, is to make people call it Kori code and not Kozi code. <laughs> code. <laughs> I've learned that. I've learned that. You see, Kori code, my tongue rolls. Uh, according to Malali's, my tongue rolls well enough on that. So, am I right? My assistant is sitting here. He's saying, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So, we, um, uh, we have a, we have, I'll, I'll take one question from Sham here, uh, Devashish. And the question is yes. yeah. Are IIMs and IITs working together close enough to make some, some sparks, some things uh, come out? Yeah, we are. You know, if you, if you look at the nature of, these institutions, they have been built according to a certain mandate. Uh, that uh -huh. was IITs are supposed to be technology, you know, providers to the world. IIMs were mm -hmm. in the space of management. And the, and, and the identity of these two were very different. IITs were more convergent as institutions. The mm -hmm. IIMs were divergent. Each IIM is different from the other. But IITs mm -hmm. more look, look more alike. You can see the two different beasts. For them to come together will take a while, but it will happen. Based yeah. on the, like, like I said, transdisciplinary. See, if you go to the fundamentals, without high quality management, engineering has no value. If you look at why IIT Delhi has started a medical uh, yeah. school, or is about yeah. to start one. Primarily because technology is becoming such a huge issue in medicine. Right. And so, so is management. And so it is possible that at the cusp of where our, our convergent spaces, and there are so many of them together, because the way a technologist think is slightly different from how a manager would think. And I think, mm. but these two thinking silos have to come together if you have to build a robust knowledge system for, for, for industry, for the country. And I have, a, I have a, because the only thing that's keeping us away from each other are ego skyscrapers. You know, these, are, these egos are huge. And our, our wisdom says that Vidya Dadati Vina. <laughs> You know, if you don't get rid of your egos, you, are, you cannot be called an educationist. And I think yeah. we are going back to those roots of what it means to be a learner. And right. uh, if the learned becomes learners, then this question will not arise. We will naturally yeah. gravitate towards each yeah. other. And it's happening. See, IIT Indore and uh, IIM Indore, they have IIT and IIM in the same place. Yeah, in the same city. Yes. yes. City. yes. We have an IIT in Palakkad, which is about uh, a couple of hours driving distance from me. I often talk to the director of IIT Palakkad and there's an uh -huh. NIT here. We, 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 we conspire yeah. with each other and all of that. And so those things are happening, but not in a scale that you'd assume they should. Yeah. Right. But incidentally, that's that's my hometown, uh, Devashish, Palakkad. I'm, oh, I'm, the, oh. I'm, I'm the notorious Palakkad here. Good, that's great. Very yeah. nice people, good looking. Uh, <laughs> Sashi Tharoor Tharu is from your city, and so they produce good looking people. That's what I realize. Is it? Is it? So, 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 that, so that, that, the average, average, average gets better when, when you when compare him and me. So it's a Tamil, so, uh, Kerala, yeah. sort of Tamil Malayalam yeah. uh, con yeah. confluence. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. So, so one last there. one last question, Debashish, before I hand it over to Tariq for his, uh, you know, the the, the, the closing. Sure. Uh, how does one deal with the divine in God's own campus? 
<laughs> See, <laughs> this is God's own country and God's own campus. I occasionally interfere. <laughs> what you call what you what you call the divine is fundamentally the realization that I am not the doer of the work mm-hmm. in its entirety. There is something that I cannot really do, even if I stretch my bit, because the world is much bigger than what my mental conception of it is. Mm. So if you ask me, what is my definition of the divine? It is some total of all the minds of all the 8 billion people in the world that can Mm. be contained by an intelligence system that makes the stars go about Mm. in their orbits. and And this is an extraordinary mind. And if you look at the collective intelligence of people that can be held in a platter, uh, mm. if, if I can't conceptualize that with my little mind, I have no other choice but to call it divine, call it by any name you like. But the divine divine is in the perception that my limitations are only of the physical structure and the mental models that I have. And my unlimited dimension is to break them and break those silos of assumptions that I'm the one doing everything. I'm the general manager of the universe. Once that dawns on me, I think divine supports you. When the ego is gone, I was told the divine eats only one thing. It is your ahamkar, which is the ego, the structure of your ego. That's the fodder for the divine. Once you begin to, is to dislodge a little bit of ego, I think there is the, and the operating definition of divine for me would be uh, a human being. Um, minus the ego is divine. A divine plus the ego becomes a human. And so yeah. that's 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 my operating definition. But thank you for this question. Lovely, 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 lovely. lovely, lovely. Sure. Thank you, thank you so much, Devashish. I'll pause here for a moment and request if Satish and Tariq want to pick up uh, or throw any supplementary oh. questions. Otherwise, uh, back to you, Tariq, for the closing honors. Satish, sure. anything you want to say prior to that? Over you know, you give me one minute. I don't want to take Tariq's time. <laughs> plenty of talks, Devashish. It's very interesting. Thank you. Appreciate that. Great. Well, um, thank you, uh, Debashis. Thank you, Satya. Uh, at the beginning of this uh, talk, before we opened it up, one of the conversation points we got into is, uh, you know, with Zoom and COVID, nobody ever stops working. We're, you know, we're running fast anyway, and we're running even faster. You see, nobody stops. And the talk today, uh, Professor, it's sort of makes us reflect a little bit like, uh, you know, this context of uh, connecting ancient values to, you know, real life. The question of, you know, a bit more humanity in our thinking and behavior, not everything has to be, you know, Wall Street driven or business driven, that kind of thing. So then the question comes, uh, okay, nice philosophy and nice uh, principles, but what does it mean? Give me the action list. So, of course, (laughs) Professor, I'm going to ask you for the action list. (laughs) And in your talk, I took away a couple. One was this uh, thing that you were drilling home, which was the breakdown of silos and uh, different uh, fiefdoms, right? Whether at universities or whether at other places, there's going to be much more interaction across disciplines. And you gave a little example, a Nobel Prize in physics really should be physics and chemistry together or something, right? So structurally, there's going to be a lot of movement. Uh, it's just going to happen. And then yes. the other one is uh, the increased uh, uh, relevance and importance of creativity. We have to value it. Now, you know, in India, the education is system what it is. In America, it's also different. Of course, here from a very young age, uh, they value individualism, which isn't always creativity. It could be egoism or selfishness, right? But uh, yeah. this whole question of how do you inject uh, this culture which values creativity is phenomenal. Because if silos are being broken down and young mm-hmm. entrepreneurs are looking at opportunities, well, be creative and look at what the implication of the silos breaking down means. So I think some of those things are very relevant to us. And uh, thank you very much. And Satya, thank you for bringing out these points. So. With that said, um, just moving forward, uh, as uh, the audience and everyone knows, we uh, try we run these on a two-weekly cycle. And for the 8th of October, we have uh, two very strong uh, uh, businessmen, corporate people. They've been with Tata and many, many other companies across uh, different parts of the world. Our Gopala Krishnan and Arana Narayanan. 
And the general theme is uh, what can the startup world learn from the corporate world and the vice versa? What can the corporate world learn from startups? So that will be a very interesting topic and our own Dr. Shriram Iyer will be running that. For day 24, uh, I had a meeting with Satish Paul and um, a bunch of us on the committee and we're looking for names. I think uh, we might go back to trying to find somebody who is an investor who has been investing in the education space. I know we had that back in July and you know, constantly to see where the money interest is going, what kind of ideas are capturing attention. So that's the program. Then of course, November, December, we'll have more. Uh, just generally, uh, a comment to our uh, illustrious uh, uh, attendees and group members. We have very, very talented people. We have about 150 people in our group. And what I'm noticing is that in this WhatsApp platform, there's a lot of uh, engagement and activity going on. People putting out their own educational series, people join them, other people engaging. So that's very, very nice. And I hope that will continue in a big way. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all our organizers and everybody. And I hope people enjoyed uh, the, the session. Much. Thanks. Thanks, Deep Chat. Thanks, Tariq. Thank Thanks, Satish. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Satya. Thank you, Satish. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. Thank you. Closing the call. Thank you. Thank you, Moini. Thanks. Bye-bye.